So uh, let me first introduce to you uh, Dr. Evdokia and Agnostu. Uh, I think uh, Evdokia exemplifies one of the ways that breakthroughs are going to occur in the sense that she is a clinician scientist and somebody who is involved with the patients, but she brings the connection to the basic science uh, to, the to, to the patient themselves. Uh, she's an assistant professor. She's a neurologist at the University of Toronto and, and at the Blurview Research Institute, and I'm proud to see that she's the lead on the Ontario Brain Institute-funded uh, program of Ontario neuro in neurodevelopmental disorders, which they call POND, which is this idea of, of connecting people across Ontario to investigate these neurodevelopmental disorders. Second is going to be Mar Dr. Marla Sokolowski. Uh, Marla is also typify something which I think is very important, uh, this idea of bringing the basic science but also the complexity of science uh, to the table. She is a university professor, and this is more than just a professor. This is the highest de designation that the University of Toronto bestows upon individuals. She's in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, and she's also the academic director of the Fraser Institute, uh, Fraser Muster Institute of Human Development. And I will also say that the two of them uh, are the ones who organized the entire uh, two, two and a half day symposium which gave us a chance to bring together all of these wonderful individuals from across the world to discuss in depth the complexities and the potential for research in autism uh, spectrum disorders. And I'm going to turn first to Evdokia. Good evening, everybody. It's absolutely a pleasure to be here today. And I have five minutes to um, give you an idea a little bit about how we're thinking the new discoveries in genomics and, ima and, and imaging and animal models and neuropathology have the potential finally to translate into meaningful new treatments. So this is our problem. We have a common disease, a common disorder, uh, affects more than 1% <coughs> of the population, more than 1% of kids in the school system right now, uh, affects both their brains and their bodies, and we still don't have a single medication that treats autism. Why is that? Um, and it, the truth is, it's not, it's not a surprise. So we knew of autism spectrum disorder as a disorder that provides, has social communication difficulties and repetitive behaviors, but until recently, we didn't know what the biology was. And if we don't know the biology, we don't have a target to develop a medication to treat the underlying condition. What's particularly exciting, and what we've been discussing quite a bit at the meeting, and we're going to continue to discuss tomorrow, is that this biology information is coming through. So as you just heard from Dr. Scherr, there is an explosion of findings in genomics, giving us more than 100 potentially candidate genes that may be involved in increasing the risk for kids with autism, for kids to develop autism. And uh, at first, it may sound like a difficult proposition to develop tr treatments for a disease that has more than 100 genes, but it turns out it's not that bad. It turns out that we may have more than 100 genes, but they tend to map into certain metabolic pathways. So this was an example that was shown before. If this is a synapse, which is a space between two nerve cells, two neurons, then there are multiple gene genes that affect either structural elements of the synapse or part of the pathway that comes after the, the postsynaptic membrane here that are actually candidate genes for autism. So although we have many, many genes that seem to be producing some risk, conferring some risk for autism, it turns out that there may be a limited number of pathways that these genes map onto, and if that is true, then we have a limited number of targets to develop medications for. It's, much, it's, it's becoming a much more manageable problem. So, um, so this is one story. The second story is we're learning a lot from uh, animal models. And some of that is uh, at the same sp space as uh, the genomic finding. So once a genomic finding has come up, people can model that genomic finding in the animal models. Another kind of avenue that people have followed is to actually study the circuitries, the, animal cir the, the brain circuitries that are involved in social communication and repetitive behaviors, since these are the two areas we have difficulty in autism, to study them in, in, in the animal model and see if we can understand its chemistry and manipulate the chemistry so we can find therapies. And I'll just show you a quick example. It's not the we can argue if it's the best example, but it's one of the examples. 
This is uh, oxytocin, which is a hormone that's produced in our brains. We all have it. We used to think of it as a female hormone because it's very important for delivery and milk letdown for women. Turns out men have plenty of oxytocin in their brains. They do not give birth and they do not breastfeed babies. So what's oxytocin doing in their brains? Turns out that if you take out the oxytocin gene, you lose a lot of your social function in the animal model. So in this case, it's a, it's a mouse experiment where if you use typically developing, let's say, mice, when you introduce a new mouse into the litter, they spend a certain amount of time sniffing each other and getting to know each other. But every time you reintroduce the mouse into the litter, they spend less and less time because now they know this mouse. They don't need to sniff as much. Turns out if you knock out the oxytocin gene, for example, Every time you reintroduce the mouse in the litter, they act as if they've never met this mouse before. So they lose part of what we call their social recognition, a finding that we also have in autism. All right, so if, and these are just two examples of the type of data that's coming out. Neuropathology studies also have implicated immune responses and a variety of other systems that we're exploring. So if that's what we are learning, what can we do with it in terms of developing new medications? Well, we have options now. We, have, we didn't have options before. What we used to do is assume that if a symptom is present in autism and in another disorder, they must be sharing biology, and therefore we can borrow drugs from other disorders and test them in autism. Well, guess what happened? Some of them actually worked, but they didn't work for the core symptoms of autism. They didn't work for the social communication, the repetitive behaviors they worked for that symptom that we had borrowed from the other disorder from. So for example, if we borrowed a drug from the ADHD world, well, it worked for ADHD in kids with autism. So we, we did not have a big impact in the actual core symptoms of autism. We have now a couple of options, extra options. One is to target the, the genomic findings, the molecular targets that are coming through this um, explosion of genomic research. There are lots and lots of examples of areas we can work, and I'm just gonna give you a cursory slide with just a couple of those. But again, this is your usual synapse, and again, we can all debate about whether these are good candidates or not. But there are plenty of targets in these synapse that are, can be manipulated right now with existing therapeutic agents. And these are drugs that are already currently in clinical trials, either in kids with autism or in kids who have other syndromes that are associated with autism to see whether we can actually manipulate the social deficits and the communication deficits and the repetitive behaviors. The other approach is to take the circuitry knowledge, the brain knowledge that we are learning from the animal models, and also um, develop therapeutics for those. For example, in the case of oxytocin, remember this is the mouse that when has no oxytocin loses its social recognition. Well, the question is, does the same thing happen in human? Turns out if you give people a stimulus like this, which is a set of eyes, and you ask them to decide what is the right emotion, people who take one dose of oxytocin are much more accurate in detecting the emotion than people who take placebo, which tastes the same, feels the same, but has no active drug in it. So if this is happening in humans, then the question is, is there room to manipulate the system in people with autism or other disorders who have social dysfunction to actually um, improve social function? This is another example, and then I'll skip to the last slide. This is the, for those of you who are families who have somebody in your family with autism will appreciate this. Turns out if you take college students who have no problems and you give them oxytocin or placebo while they're watching faces, people who have no problem when they are on oxytocin spend more, item, more time looking at eyes than mouth and the non-social parts of the picture than if they're taking placebo. So oxytocin reorients you to the social parts of the face, including the eyes, which we know is an issue for autism. So, in this context, there have been multiple initiatives in Ontario, and I want to highlight the Ontario Brain Institute Pond Initiative um, because of its sheer kind of size and commitment to fund uh, from basic science and genomics all the way to clinical trials. So the idea here is we take in autism and other related disorders such as ADHD, intellectual disability, or obsessive compulsive disorder, we're studying their, the, we invited the families to come in, 
They can contribute genetic material. We can study their coding sequences on their genes. We can study the way the genes speak to their body or interact with the environment. We can image them. We look at their structure and the function of their brain. We can look at the peripheral nervous system and see if we can see we have markers for anxiety and so on. And then we can put them in clinical trials and test all these innovative compounds as they're coming up the pipeline and start figuring out what works and what are the biological markers, such as genetics and imaging and so on, that predict response, so that we can start individualizing treatments for kids with autism based on their biology. And I'm going to stop at that.